to Professor Bainbridge. Thanks, Leo. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, proponents of H.R. 1257 or any other federal legislation that would give shareholders a vote on executive comp uh, have to carry, I think, a burden of persuading us of three distinct claims. First, that there's an executive compensation crisis, and Harvey's addressed that, and I will respond. Second, that any such legislation ought to occur at the federal level. Harvey's quite right, the states could do it, but Barney Frank in H.R. 1257 and Senator Obama with the similar legislation in the Senate uh, want to see it done at the federal level, so I think it is fair to address the federalism issues. Uh, and thirdly, whether say on pay is an effective solution to the problem. Um, I will be posting a, a revised and extended version of my remarks to SSRN when I get uh, back to California, um, and that will probably take a few days, but there will be a link to it eventually uh, on my website, businessassociationsblog.com, uh, and you're welcome to, to check out the more extended remarks. Well, uh, Harvey teed up the, the whole question of how executive compensation has been skyrocketing uh, in recent years, and, and who can argue, right? It, it is a lot higher than it used to be. And in particular, the disparity between what the average CEO makes and the average worker at that CEO's firm makes has increased dramatically. Um, and my response to that is, well, so what? We live in an era in which many occupations carry uh, extremely high compensation. Out in Los Angeles, where I live, uh, top movie stars get $20 million a film. The average salary of an NBA uh, player is $4 million a year. Top investment bankers earn bonuses of 5 to $15 million a year. New York Times story said that the top investment banker at Goldman Sachs in 2006 pulled down $54 million a year in salary bonuses and stock options. And all of that is dwarfed by what some private hedge funds uh, managers are making. That same New York Times story reported that James Simons earned $1.7 billion, that's billion with a B, uh, dollars in 2006 alone. And moreover, he was not the only one. There were three hedge fund managers that year that cracked the billion dollar barrier. So we have to really ask, why are we singling out executive compensation? Isn't what we're really outraged about is some sort of populist concern with um, income inequality, with wealth disparity. Uh, and if that's right, isn't the solution simply to go back to the confiscatory marginal tax rates that prevailed in the 1960s? Um, people on my side of the political aisle like to point to President John F. Kennedy as a tax cutter. Um, but it's worth remembering that President Kennedy's big tax cut only sliced the top marginal federal tax rate from 90 to 70 percent. Um, but a 70 percent marginal tax rate would probably take care of a lot of these problems if you think they are a problem. And if what I read about Barack Obama's tax proposals, maybe that's where we're going. But the question is, why are we singling out managers uh, who make this compensation? Well, again, I think Harvey has teed it up quite nicely. The question is pay for performance. Uh, when a sports star, when Randy Moss, who I guess is a rumor say is about to re-sign with the Patriots, signs that deal, uh, he will have bargained at arm's length with the Pats and reached a price that the Pats presumably feel reflect uh, his performance. And of course, the argument about executive compensation is that managers are not acting at arm's length. Managers are bargaining with compensation committees and boards of directors that are in the pocket uh, of management. And so if there is an executive compensation crisis, I would argue that it is not in the amount of compensation, but rather in the claim that pay has been decoupled from performance. Now, the argument, of course, is that pay ought to incentivize performance. We're all familiar with the famous Burley and Means. Separation of ownership and control leads to 
agency cost problems, a principal agent problem, uh, under which managers shirk. Uh, and there's no question, of course, but that the corporation uh, is characterized by such a principal agent problem. Uh, managers do sometimes shirk, substituting leisure for labor. More likely, because management tends to make undiversifiable investments in firm-specific human capital, tends to have undiversified investment portfolios that are heavily weighted towards the stock of their employers, managers tend to be more risk-averse than diversified shareholders because they're subject to firm-specific risks that shareholders can diversify away. And in theory, executive compensation schemes ought to be optimally designed to limit those divergences and so as to bring management and shareholder uh, incentives together. Yet, uh, Bebchuk and Freed, as you saw in the reading, argue that managers, in fact, are able to capture rents, that is, amounts in excess of what they would uh, get as a result of arm's length bargaining. Now, it's certainly true that directors all too often are chosen de facto by the CEO. Once a director is on the board of directors, moreover, there are incentives, both financial and social, uh, for the director to sort of go along, to get along, and to uh, give the CEO what the CEO wants uh, in terms of pay packages. But I think that Bebchuk and Freed have significantly overstated the case. And there is a uh, fairly substantial literature, particularly growing out of reviews of their book, uh, which argues, for example, that even though there are situations in which this so-called managerial power exists, that the executive uh, compensation arrangements that we see nevertheless appear to be optimally designed to minimize the costs uh, of that power. Uh, another reviewer argued that most of the results that Bebchuk and Freed identified uh, uh, can be deemed to be consistent with less sinister uh, explanations. Uh, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, going back to the question of whether we have an executive compensation crisis or a wealth disparity crisis, um, there, are there are several economists who have found that, quote, the six-fold increase of CEO pay between 1980 and 2003 can be fully attributed to the six-fold increase in market capitalization of U.S. corporations during the same time period. In other words, CEOs got richer as their shareholders got richer. An important piece of evidence in support of this claim, I think, is that there are relatively modest differences in pay practices between firms that have a controlling shareholder and those that don't. Now, if the managerial power hypothesis was correct and managers were negotiating with boards that were in their pockets, wouldn't we expect to see significant differences between pay practices at firms with dispersed share ownership and pay practices at firms with concentrated share ownership. After all, a large block holder presumably can use its influence on the board and indeed on management to check pay practices that are deemed not to be in shareholder interests. And while it's certainly true that there are some differences between pay practices at such firms, they are not as, very, as dramatic as one might have expected. Uh, and so perhaps executive compensation is not as out of line with performance as Babchuk and Freed would have us believe. 